So we're very happy to have Anupam um, talk to us about spin entanglement witness for graviton. Slightly different from. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine. Um, so since I'm the last speaker, so let me uh, first of all thank um, uh, Doug, Anna Maria, and Josephine for organizing this wonderful workshop along with Lance and Ted uh, and all the audiences and um, uh, they asked fabulous questions and all the speakers. Um, so it was, uh, it has been excellent, uh, uh, you know, experience for myself. Um, okay, so with this, um, uh, let me uh, share with uh, all of you what I have been thinking with uh, some of my colleagues and um, uh, about uh, spin entanglement witness for Graviton. Uh, so I'm from University of Groningen and um, the idea is to collide uh, uh, Schrodinger kittens. So how do I collide Schrodinger kittens? That's the kind of question we are, we are going to explore. And uh, the, the, the things which we are going to uh, speak today is quite generic. Um, you can use for fifth force uh, precision test for low energy QED, dark matter, and various other applications which one can think about. Uh, let me also thank my collaborators with whom I have been working on this. Uh, Andy just now has spoken them. Uh, about uh, his work on Casimir and uh, fabulous things which uh, we have learned from him. And uh, my longtime collaborator, Sugato Bose, with whom I have been bouncing some of these ideas on and off for the past 10 years. And, um, and, and that has resulted in this uh, uh, collaboration, which involved um, um, colleagues from Australia, Israel, um, and um, uh, Slovenia, and many different parts of the world. Okay, so um, so uh, what, what what we are actually after? So we uh, it's a fundamental curiosity, um, very humble question, nothing very complicated, but not very uh, in, in perhaps uh, very ambitious, but very simple question. Um, at the simplest level, I want to understand uh, the properties of gravity, and the gravity is being mediated at the quantum level, at the level of quantum field theory. We know spin two graviton. So I want to understand understand whether the spin to graviton, uh, does it have a mass? The, uh, if it's massless, what are the degrees of freedom which propagates between, say, space-time points? Does it have tachyons or ghosts or any kind of uh, interesting degrees of freedom? So I want to understand these degrees of freedom. Yeah. Um, and not only for general relativity, but you can also extend this to any high derivative exten extension of general relativity, because you know that GR is derivative theories. Mass, if it's massless, it's derivative theory, uh, you can add further terms, uh, quadratic in curvature, cubic order and high order local and non-local contributions. And so you can look, uh, add many, many terms at the effective level. Yeah. So uh, you want to, I want to understand uh, some of these aspects, but I want to understand also some quantum correlations as well. And as you know that any tensor quantity can be recast in terms of uh, tensor degrees of freedom, vector degrees of freedom, scalar degrees of freedom. And this has been known since the days of uh, Peter van Leeuwenhuizen and many other stalwarts have discussed this in 50s and 60s, especially Ray Rivers uh, when he was very uh, lecturer at the Imperial College when he joined um, uh, in 60s. Um, so, so some of the th things which I'm going to talk about, the techniques has been known for almost uh, half, a uh, half a century. Okay, so the basic assumption is very simple, is the quantum field theory of uh, gravity, perturbative quantum field theory of gravity. So since we are working on quantum field theory uh, frameworks, so quantum mechanics and relativity are uh, the only uh, two important ingredient. We, we believe in the light cone structure, nothing goes outside the light cone structure as far as the information is concerned. And the origin of force and, uh, is essentially due to exchange of quanta. Example, Yukawa, you pick up Yukawa, Coulomb interaction, Newton's potential. So all these potentials at the non-relativistic limit, uh, we are imagining due to exchange of some quantum. Yeah. Um, so this is the basic assumption, basic underlying principle. And based on this, we'll discuss the rest of the talk. So plan of my talk uh, is Graviton. Uh, can I think about it uh, as a quantum entity? Um, so um, um, and, uh, in order to set up the stage, what I will do is that I will discuss uh, the quantum divide for gravity. Uh, and then I will discuss uh, the protocol which uh, uh, with Andy and Sugato we have all involved in. I'll discuss uh, various experimental challenges. There is no dirt of experimental challenges. And at the end of the day, I'll discuss, uh, we'll need a, a 
collaboration, which is fairly international collaboration, because uh, it's slightly hard to do these kind of experiments in one's uh, own lab. So what is a quantum device? So let's say that we want to treat a uh, um, matter part and the gravity on equal footing. Let's say that we want to, if we want to quantize matter, we want to quantize graviton, at least around the weak curvature limit. Okay, so suppose, uh, uh, so let's say the weak curvature limit would be, let's take around Minkowski space time. And let's uh, imagine for the time being that we want to discuss the non relativistic uh, aspects. So essentially my Lagrangian is simply given uh, by my mass of the uh, particle, which I'm uh, going to take into account and its interaction with my gravity. Now uh, let's place ourselves uh, in a Fermi normal coordinate system. Uh, it's the world line uh, approach. So uh, in, in this coordinate system, it's very easy to see how uh, it's quite transparent to see how graviton interacts with matter. And um, so it, it essentially interacts with your, um, the Riemann term, uh, the zero one components essentially. And this is a, effectively, this is the interaction term you would get. You know, let's, let's say that we want to treat uh, matter and gravity on equal footing. Um, and let's say that we want to discuss physics around uh, weak curvature limit around, so this, let's say, Minkowski space time, because the majority of the experiments which we are doing in laboratory, uh, Minkowski space time is a fairly good, uh, you know, space time. And let's place ourselves uh, in, a, for, uh, in a coordinate system of a world line of my particle trajectory. So it's a Fermi normal coordinate system. It's a very simple and convenient way to describe uh, physics, uh, especially in, uh, for the non-relativistic systems which we are discussing. So in this frame, you, you, I mean, you can know, you, you can read the, the interaction between say matter and the graviton, and um, you can actually then just assume the canonical quantization for graviton around the Minkowski background, as well as for the matter, okay. Now, suppose you ask yourself just a very um, simple question you ask that, uh, suppose I want to trace out all the matter degrees of freedom. And uh, so this is the interaction. And as you can see that this interaction is actually dictated by your connection with gravity, the interaction with the graviton, as well as your X square. And you can see very easily in this, uh, that it's, effectively it is dictated by your equivalence principle. As soon as X goes to zero, the interaction effectively goes to zero between gravity and matter. And uh, in this set of setup, in this coordinate system, if you say that, look, let's trace out the matter degrees of freedom, because that's the simplest thing which we can do perhaps. And if you do that, then what you find very interestingly is that for the graviton sector, you get a displaced vacuum. So displaced coherent state. So your coherent, your, uh, the vacuum state for graviton gets displaced essentially. And corresponding to this displaced coherent state, uh, you get a number operator. So you can talk about, say, number of gravitons associated with your uh, system, say, mass M. And amazingly, if, uh, if you do this, uh, it's a very simple calculation, down to earth calculation. And uh, so this is what I tried to uh, show you. So we had a coupling between matter and graviton. I trace out all the matter degrees of freedom, and I'm left with the purely graviton sector. Then the number of gravitons corresponding to this displaced vacuum amazingly relates this quantity called g m square. g is the Newton's constant, m is the mass. And this again relates to nothing but your area of your black hole. And again, it rings the bell, that familiar bell, what uh, you know, our, um, you know, st many Stalvers have talked about, holographic principle from Toft and from also from uh, uh, um, um, many other people have talked about the holographic principle. But what it tells you at the end of the day, that the number of gravitons is inherently connected with the mass associated with the system uh, you, know, you are associating with. I'm and if the I'm mass is less than M Planck, so M Planck is- I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but why are you talking about graviton? Because if you say non-activistic system, uh, uh, it's not counting graviton, it's, a, a, you st it's kind of instantaneous interaction, which is not counting any number of gravitons at all. Um, Arkady, yeah, it's a good question. Let's come back to it. Uh, I, I will discuss this. I, I'm sure. sorry, just to interrupt. Uh, yeah. No, sorry. no, no problem. Good that you asked me this question. Definitely. So the number of gravitons in this uh, context um, 
uh, as I was telling you, that um, for a mass less than M Planck, which is roughly 10 less to minus 5 gram, is effectively less than 1. And for any astrophysical black holes, if you take, um, it becomes very large. And as, so this, this relationship is actually not completely new per se. It was first discussed by Ruffini way back in 1960s. And then um, perhaps some of you know that Gia has been uh, proposing this uh, idea of uh, treating black hole as a corpuscular theory. And essentially even there also you get the same relationship. But in this, in his case, he actually assumes that the black hole is made up of n number of gravitons. And then he uh, proceeds and shows that, yes, the Hawking evaporation rate and many other aspects of black hole can be understood in this very simple language. But the idea is that if the number of gravitons becomes very, very large, then what happens is that extracting the quantum information becomes also very hard. So system effectively treats like a classical, almost classical. So you can do the same game for just for this fun sake, you can think about our universe on a world line. And if you trace out all the matter degrees of freedom, uh, effectively it is given by this quantity, which is again the same as we, we were discussing the Bekenstein's bound, it, satisfy, it saturates the Bekenstein bound. It's given by Max and Planck and the Hubble expansion rate. And if you take the today's Hubble expansion rate, you find the number of uh, gravitons would be humongously large. So effectively, our current universe is effectively a classical system. Okay, but this provides us also slim chance for doing some experiment with gravity. So if the mass of the system, which I'm dealing with, roughly is of the order of one part in 10 to five grams, or even less than that, then the number of gravitons in, this, in such a system is less than one, and there is a possibility that I may be able to extract some quantum behavior of graviton. Okay, some quantum aspects which we can perhaps explore. So let's take a very simple uh, example. Let's say that just for the argument's sake, I take the mass of the system to be one part in 10 to 11 grams, which is smaller than one part in 10 to five. And number of gravitons in this context is uh, way too small, one part in 10 to 12. So let's say that my apparatus, my system, uh, I have got two boxes and Gravity has to be leaky because it interacts with everything. So you cannot screen gravity like electromagnetism. So I have got a red box and have got a black box. And let's say that the sizes are roughly delta X for our practical purposes. The quantum experiment has certain size that corresponds to delta X and they are separated by distance D. But each an individual box contains some number of graviton states, but they are so small, but still they can interact with each other through some graviton exchange. And that has to be some offshell exchange, okay? Now you can ask the question, if this is the setup, what is the phase it will induce? Well, that is also easy to compute. You can compute the action due to the two boxes, two, two massive systems. You can compute the action which is given by your gravitational potential and the time at, uh, you, you want to observe the system and your hash bar. And you see that suppose you, as I said, that if you take the mass to be roughly 10 to minus 11 gram, just for the, ex of course, ex uh, example, you can pick up any, any such mass. And you see that this quantity nothing is, is nothing but your number of gravitons stored in the system. And let's assume the two masses are the same. Then you, then you ask the question, suppose you want to keep this experiment alive for roughly one second, because that's the kind of time scale you would love to um, explore in your experiment. Then the, the size between uh, or the distance away from each other has to be roughly 100 microns. So that's the, some length scale, some rough uh, distance we are talking about. But then one can ask, okay, so this is the phase uh, you are measuring. It's a, it could be a classical phase. It doesn't have to be quantum phase, but when will it be quantum? Can I, can I talk about some kind of like an entanglement phase from here? The answer is yes. You can talk about some kind of entanglement phase, but then the wave function of the two boxes, uh, red box and the blue box, they have to overlap with each other, sufficient overlap such that there is some quantum interaction. I set up some quantum interaction. And in order to do that, it will be clear later on that the, de the distance delta X and D, so the hierarchy between D and delta X cannot be large. It has to be fairly close to, um, I mean, to uh, each other. So delta X over D, 
course, it is less than one, but it cannot be very, very smaller than one. If it becomes smaller than one, then effectively the two wave functions separate sufficiently enough that the overlap becomes smaller and smaller. And as a consequence, the entanglement becomes also weaker and weaker. Okay, so with this um, bit of theoretical background, let's ask ourselves what kind of um, experiment would we like to do? Now, anything to do with quantum would involve perhaps spin, which is a very nice way to think about because it gives me a ruler. I can talk about spin up and spin down system. And uh, from the experimental perspective, it's very nice because they can take diamond, um, which is a high dense, highly dense uh, um, object, and uh, di diamond has an uh, NV center, so it's a defect where they can place the electron spin, and so a diamond becomes your quantum system, a quantum dice, and I can roll the quantum dice, and I can talk about how many times I get spin up and spin down system. And fortunately for such a system, uh, our material scientists, uh, they understand what are the, what is the Hamiltonian at least. So the, the basic Hamiltonian will be, which we know from our you know, undergraduate days, the interaction between the spin of a system and the external magnetic field. Since diamond is a, a, it's a diamantic material, so in presence of external magnetic field, it will also induce, uh, induce diamantic potential. So these are the two important terms where the spin can actually interact with each, uh, uh, can see the external magnetic field and the diamond can also feel the external magnetic field. Okay, now if you want to understand a little bit of graviton, it is very similar in essence, in a spirit wise, it's very similar to exploring the Higgs physics at LSC. So our, our colleagues from the Higgs physics from ATLAS, CMS, is a similar experiment. They are colliding the proton-proton beam. So one can think about that, okay, they are also like Alice and Bob system. Their proton is my quantum system. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, boosting in the center of mass energy, roughly around 14 TeV in the LHC. And as a consequence, in, this, in the process of collision, I'm trying to understand the property of Higgs. So what's happening is that, uh, and the way I'm witnessing it is, why am I? Just one particular channel will be my four lepton channel. In the final leg, I get the four leptons. These are, this is a witness. I can also uh, have different channels such as diphoton channels and so on and so forth. So in the same essence, in the same way, we can also think about, suppose if I bring in two particles, say Alice and Bob, if I, of course, if I collide them, uh, of course, I will excite some graviton. And the question is, by looking at the final states, can I figure out some properties of a graviton? Like whether the graviton is massless or what kind of uh, degrees of freedom does it have and so on and so forth. So when it comes to understand these uh, uh, aspects, so uh, we, uh, in, in, uh, we need to rely on certain quantum properties. Like in old days in the lab, when people were talking about, uh, you know, e, e plus E minus machine, they were talking about backward forward scattering events and, you know, you could you know, show the asymmetry. And that was precisely because the, in, the, in the case of uh, electron um, E plus E minus machine, you have the helicity in the electron sector and you can compute this kind of like asymmetry. So similar kind of asymmetry, perhaps we, maybe we can do it even in the case of gravity so that we can understand basically depending because now I'm, I can use my spin and spin has a helicity up and down. I can play this trick perhaps to see if I can extract some aspects of graviton property here or not. So this is what I meant when I say that uh, I want to collide the Schrodinger kitten. So I can create now um, Schrodinger state for my two masses and I bring them sufficiently close to each other. Of course, this experiment is, I'm doing this, we are doing this experiment in a non-relativistic limit, but in principle, you can think about doing this experiment even relativistically. Nothing stops you from doing it relativistic. You just give a boost, you scatter the two masses, and in a high, very extremely, extremely high energy limit, you can compute the scattering cross-section, and you can talk about the uh, spin states and helicity states. So I was talking about the helicity states, so because of the spin, I can talk about, um, so this is my S matrix uh, going from initial to final state. And I can, I, essentially I have a right, right, so essentially left and right, I have two states. And corresponding to both the left and right, I have a spin up and spin down. So I can talk about spin up, up, spin down, down, up, down, and down, up. So all possible, four possible states I can construct. And as a consequence, I can talk about the normalization. And this is in the, in the quantum information language, this is known as the magic state. 
um, and people can compute the concurrence with this kind of uh, state. So, so this is the, essentially the experiment which we propose with our colleagues, uh, with Andy and Sugato. Um, um, this is uh, in 2017. And also on the same day, there was a paper by Blatko and uh, Marletto from Oxford. They also had the same similar paper, similar kind of idea um, along with uh, uh, us. So, so in principle, you can compute the concurrence or you can also compute the witness. But experimentally, it is easier to compute the witness because you can, so, so you have a system one and you have got a system two. Now, system one is the stern gerlach apparatus. System two is also stern gerlach apparatus. And after the completion of the experiment, you are measuring the spin. So spin up, so you get spin up and the spin down. So you can have 50-50 probability or you can have slightly difference like up, 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 down, down, up. So there is, there's a, there's a way you can build a correlation between the spins, spins coming from the final state from system one and the spins coming from the final state of spin two. And you can construct a basis dependent witness and you can compute um, in this particular basis dependent, you can compute the entanglement, whether the system, uh, if, if, if this satisfies so in this particular basis dependent witness, if this is satisfied, then you can say that at least the system one and system two are entangled and provided there's no other interaction other than gravity, and that's a big, big challenge, and it's no, no way one can achieve it so easily. But suppose if we can achieve it, that the only interaction between the two systems is purely gravity, then we can say that at least this graviton, which we are talking about as a mediator, has certain quantum properties. So that's the kind of like um, setup we have in mind. And as I said, that you can compute the entanglement phase, and you see that at the point which I was making that delta X here cannot be zero. At the moment delta X goes to zero, the entanglement phase goes to zero. So the delta X has to be fairly close to D. And so again, for if I take the masses to be roughly 10 raised to minus 11 gram, if I keep the system alive for one second, then uh, the distances I need is roughly 200 micron, the closest separation and the delta X roughly 100 micron. But, uh, Having said so, the life is not easy because diamond is a, it also has dielectric properties. And given the dielectric properties, uh, you can immediately say that, look, even they can exchange photons. So this is exactly the Feynman diagram for a, uh, essentially you have got a dipole, two dipoles here, two dipoles here, and the photon interaction. And uh, just uh, uh, my, uh, uh, Andy was talking about that he can measure the Casimir interaction. And this, this is the place where actually Andy told us that we have to be very, very careful when you approach the distance of 200 micron because the Casimir can be a big headache. And indeed it does become a big headache because this uh, Casimir induced entanglement phase and the graviton induced entanglement phase becomes fairly close to each other. So if you want that at least gravity should dominate at least 10 times, then you have to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, these masses have to be roughly around one part in 10 to 11. And the separation has to be close to 200 micron and delta X roughly has to be 100 micron. So, but having said so, there are many, many challenges. There are many problems with decoherence. One has to be very, very careful with the vacuum. The vacuum, uh, in order to avoid any decoherence uh, from air molecule or photon scattering from absorption and uh, emission of black body photons, the temperature has to be very, very cold, uh, has to be very, very close to uh, ground state. And the vacuum has to be one of the best vacuum which we can imagine. Perhaps uh, the best vacuum is, uh, um, you know, the CERN can create the one of the best vacuum where they collide the PP uh, system, proton, proton. This is extremely hard to achieve uh, with the current technology, but maybe with the help of technology, we can improve. And there are many, many problems associated with it. There are, you have to prepare your initial wave package. You have to neutralize any electromagnetic charges. There should not be any patch potential as uh, Andy was discussing. You have to internally cool because diamond has phonons. You, even phonon vibration can destroy the coherence. The, the process that you are switching on and off will give you some noise, which you have to do. You have to create the macroscopic superposition. There's also a problem with the Humpty Dumpty, which was first uh, pointed out by Scully and Schwinger and Ongle. The fact that you have to maintain the spin coherence of the system extremely, extremely well. So there are many, many headaches. 
and uh, you have to eventually you have to read the spin states. And so having said so, it's extremely, extremely non-trivial, extremely, extremely hard experiment, but nevertheless, uh, you know, it can be done in future. There's one way you can screen the electromagnetic interaction if you place a, a, a conducting, uh, you know, thin conducting sheet, which, which can actually screen the electromagnetic interaction. So there is a way to screen the electromagnetic interaction here. But, but the two system can still interact via gravity, via gravity, because gravity cannot be screened. So there are certain advantages of doing this kind of uh, procedure, but since I already uh, lost some time because of this, I will skip some of these things and we can discuss by in, uh, in, uh, in the discussion session, if you like. But, and uh, corresponding to this, we, we have also in, uh, studied the dephasing and decoherence and uh, witness parameter and all points towards, uh, you see the kind of temperature which we are talking about, the internal temperature of the diamond has to be 0 0.15 Kelvin, the external temperature has to be one Kelvin. So it's extremely, extremely daunting task, uh, which we are talking about. But one of the things which uh, many of our colleagues have spoken in this workshop is about the gravity gradient noise. So any experiment we want to do with gravity, uh, gravity itself becomes actually a big background and big uh, enemy for us because any, if, even if there is a butterfly which passes by, will induce a uh, phase to my system, to my interferometer system. If a snake slithers, that will also induce a phase to my um, in interferometer system. And some of these things have been analyzed in the context of LIGO and VIRGO. Um, there was a very classic paper by Kip Thorne and his colleagues where they, he analyzed uh, essentially some of these noises, gravity gradient noise, relative uh, acceleration noises. So. In order to actually tame some of these noises, what we realized is you have to really take into account of seismic noises, jerks, the cars, the planes passing by, there's a continuous motion, uh, there's a you know, marching um, uh, you know, ar army people, whatever you name it, there's always a problem here. So you have to really tame it. And one way you can tame it is to construct a drop tower experiment because drop tower experiment, uh, what happens to so this is schematic draw drawing, the best way to go underground, because in the underground, you have a seismic noise extremely low, um, and you can create a various levels, various layers of your capsule. So inside the innermost capsule, your experiment is happening. Then you are surrounded by another capsule. Then you put a couple of layers so that your vacuum gets better and better, and then you let it fall freely for roughly say 50 to 100 meters, because that's the place where the seismic noise uh, becomes much, much weaker. So there are many, many challenges, but it also opens up a unique possibility of performing these kind of experiments underground. And this is one reason perhaps some uh, these kind of experiments can't be done so cheaply. But having said so, there are other kind of challenges. How do you really create a macroscopic superposition of roughly 100 micron? And that itself is a big thing because no one has ever uh, you know, created such a, um, a superposition for masses which we are demanding, 10 to minus 11 grams or 10 to minus 14 kilograms. The best uh, you know, experiment setup has been performed by Arndt's group, which we know just now, uh, Andy uh, you know, highlighted that, roughly 10 to minus 21 kilograms. So we, we are talking about six or seven orders of magnitude of jump. And uh, whether we can do it in technologically, that's itself is a very big question. And so some of the things which we are working on with our colleagues uh, from uh, Israel, especially Ron Foreman's group, and uh, this is a recent paper which uh, accepted in Science Advance, he was uh, able to show that this entire, is it was just a feasibility check that one can complete a one stern girl lack loop. That itself was a challenge and it has been recently been performed by his, uh, uh, the experimental group by Ron Paulman for a mass roughly one part in 10 to 20 grams. So still you see that we have to have, we require a huge jump and hopefully with technology, maybe we'll be able to reach the stage um, um, we want. But having said so, the problem becomes very, very interesting. It becomes exactly like the, the, the acceleration. Uh, how would you accelerate say proton or how would you accelerate electron in a, in a, in a, a, a you know, like LEP machine or in uh, um, uh, LHC. Similar kind of problem arises. The, here you need the acceleration mechanism to split the superposition, even in stern garlic. So you have to have a very uh, interesting configuration of the magnetic field to create a large macroscopic superposition at the very first instance. And today, actually, we had a paper 
uh, ex uh, uh, especially addressing is exactly this particular point, that how would you get a large splitting for a massive Schrodinger kittens? So um, still we are very far away from what we would love to see. So you can see that this is the mass range and you can see that the splitting is still not what we would love to have for the, to, to perform the gravity experiment. We would still need to do one or two orders of magnitude better, but in principle, it is possible to take masses roughly such as 10 to minus 14 kilogram, and you can get a split, uh, this, and the split and the superposition. So in this scheme, we could get, get something like 0 0.01 micrometer, but we still have to go to 10 of micrometers. It's still a daunting task. So gradually we are still trying to see how we can uh, you know, get this large superposition. And um, the, essentially the, uh, it's an open problem right now. Uh, so here we showed that how to close the interferometer because one has to see that the interferometer gets closed. You have to see whether the, you know, the, the Humpty Dumpty problem does not bite you at the end of the day. So one has to take into account of all possible fluctuations, including the dephasing, including the decoherence effects and everything. So just to, uh, for me to conclude, because I have already spent some time already with my um, nuisance of uh, this iPad, uh, it is an interesting protocol. It unites many, many aspects of physics. Um, you see that you require cooling technology, you require material science. From theory aspects, you require this fundamental aspects of quantum field theory. You can even probe physics beyond the standard model, like axion physics to some extent, um, um, uh, Andy uh, already pointed out. You require atom optics, tra trapping transitions, uh, levitation techniques. Uh, condensed matter system comes in because after all, you're talking about cooling this, uh, you know, diamond um, roughly at a, a ground state and phonon vibrations and all these things you need to um, obtain. You, is, you have a fantastic way to even uh, probe Cassini effects or new fifth force in this process because whatever I have said, you can also use it for uh, even for charge particle charge superposition, and you can probe the fifth force, or you can do very low energy frontier of QED experiments. So it opens up many, many uh, uh, interesting avenues for physics, and definitely we would like to see big labs such as Fermilab or CERN, some of these facilities uh, can be, if it can be useful, it is fantastic because the kind of vacuum which we are talking about, only these Fermilab and CERN can ever produce. 10 to minus 15 Pascal or 10 to minus 16 Pascal. And here comes uh, the, 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 uh, you know, the adventures taken by Jerry, um, um, Andy's co uh, colleague uh, in Northwestern, um, who's really ha who has pioneered one of these uh, subjects, how to create one of the best vacuum in the world to, to, to do these, all these kind of experiments. So it, I think it's, a, it's very important for us to now think about some kind of international collaboration. Uh, it opens up various doors for how to create this massive uh, split for massive system, large splitting, you require extreme technology, uh, cooling and vacuum technology, material science, coherence, and of course the underground uh, drop tower facilities uh, makes it even harder to do these kind of experiments. So anyway, nevertheless, uh, you know, this, uh, that's the challenge which we learned that our experiments are indeed hard, but um, nevertheless, there, there, there's many things which perhaps one can do in future. So with this, let me thank all of you Thanks for your patience. And I'm really, really sorry that uh, I had to take a break a couple of times with my iPad. Thanks. Thanks, Danny Pong. Very, very nice talk. Um, yeah, so um, we'll open it up for discussion. Yeah, Jake. Thank you so much for that conversation. I there's actually a lot going on, and, um, and I'm not certain what to talk about vis-a-vis -vis geopolitical issues, but uh, going backwards Hello, from there. Can, can, uh, can you hear me? I can't hear Jake. Oh. Um, Is that better? No. Huh. I can hear Jake. I can um, hear him. All right. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, anyway, I'll say it, and I can also type it in chat, I suppose. On your palm, can but you the main question I have has to do with coming back to the idea, what do we mean by gravitational superposition and how do we quantify the size of it? So you're proposing a metric, which is what you call the number of gravitons. And I guess it would be, I'd be kind of curious your thoughts about 
how that metric works in some of the other types of experiments that have been proposed over the course of the last few days. Thanks for asking this uh, very uh, nice question. So, um, in some sense, yes, you can think about is uh, like a uh, metric fluctuations. The number of gravitons here is kind of like metric fluctuations. So, if you if imagine that if you are, uh, you know, if your system is not very heavy, if you if you don't saturate the uh, you know the limit where um, the the uh, the m is roughly uh, of the order of m Planck, um, then essentially uh, you're uh, you're talking about a, a system of gravity which is very weakly coupled. Essentially, the number of gravitons which you are exciting is very very small in some sense. Arkady, um, sorry, before um, Arkady speaks, um, so Anupam, can, can you hear us? Can you hear everyone? No, okay. Oh, sorry. Um, Okay, so um, okay, so that is a problem. Um, yeah, maybe Arkady, if you could just speak, um, ask your question, and then maybe also type something to Anupam to communicate it to him because he can't hear us. No, I, I, I look, yeah. uh, essentially, I am repeating myself. Uh, you know, I asked him during the uh, moment when he mentioned gravi gravitons. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, he, he, he appeared. Okay, okay. Uh, right, and uh, I, I disagree with the point to call it gravitons because what, I, what, 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 what is called gravitons, it is counting you know, like, like number of photons, whatever, for gravitons is, is the same. Uh, and to say that, uh, for example, electromagnetic interaction is exchange of photons, uh, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a little bit too much because in some way uh, there is relation between instantaneous interaction and uh, no, exchange by real photons indeed, but it is uh, Lorentz invariance. It's about, if you are not talking about, say, kind of uh, checking uh, locality in including uh, Lorentz invariance, whatever, then uh, it's just instantaneous interaction uh, and uh, and to call it a uh, smaller, large number of gravitons, I believe it is n not relevant. Okay, but, but I already asked it, so, so Anupam, you, are, you know what I'm asking about, right? Good, good, good. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Now I can hear, uh, fortunately. Maybe it was uh, the internet connection from my side. Yeah, so, okay, so, okay. Um, so, Arkady, I, I agree with you, and there is also, there is some amount of uh, uh, disagreement. So, I can tell you both. So take an example of, uh, forget gravity. No, no, you, should, say that, you should choose as you agree or disagree. You know. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, I mean, we are discussing physics. So let's say we, we want to forget gravity for the time. Being. We want to say electromagnetism, QED experiment. Let's say we take a molar scattering. In molar scattering is also like a one, uh, you know, it's a photon exchange. Now, it's, of course, you can say that from your no, point of view. No, it's, instant, not, uh, it's not photon exchange. It's what I'm trying to make it point. It's not for an exchange if you had non lgb 6 system. Okay, let's say, say, fine, I agree with you. Let's say that for the timing that is uh, instantaneous Coulomb interaction. Yeah. Fair enough. But even in, uh, in a molar scattering, I can build up my helicity states and I can talk about how the helicities are entangled. Helicity if of what? My photon helicity. is classical. Helicity of so, particle, but not helicity of photons. Yeah, so, exactly. Helicity of particle, not the photon. Yeah, right. absolutely. And that's what I'm, ha I'm happy. So even if I take instantaneous, I can build up entanglement between helicity of electrons and compute my forward backward scattering. No, yes. I agree. Uh, so, uh, so, 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 so it's a that quantum that... property. No, no, but it's, it's not it... a classical property. No, but look, uh, this, inter this interaction between, say, spins, uh, you, uh, is a, you can say that it's also, in certain senses, part of instantaneous interaction. So, so okay. there is That's no your problem. language, and I, I respect that, but what I'm, I'm concerned with, not about instantaneous or, or 
feel what is important for me is a spin correlation. Right. But, I want you, but you call it number. But you call it number of gravitons, and I disagree with the terminology, if you like. You you should not call it uh, number of gravitons. Okay. Uh, you can call it uh, some other way. Doesn't matter. But uh, what I uh, my first half of what I was showing. Suppose if I trace out all the matter degrees of freedom, whatever you call it, no. it is in a displaced coherent state. No, no, no. I, look, I, I I am not arguing <laughs> against this. I am arguing that when you call it a number of gravitons, I believe it's a kind of misleading terminology. Okay. What would you like to call, say, for instance? What would no, be I your... mean, you can say that it is a, a, a amplitude of this gravity field or whatever. You can call it uh, any okay. any way you like, right? But uh, but I mean, but but uh, but uh, when I say in the word graviton, you already imply that you can, you know, you have propagating uh, graviton, and it is not what no, you no, are. It's a self-contained system. So that's the beauty, beautiful thing that we are talking about a self-gravitating system. So what, okay, you may you may not call it number of gravitons. You can, can call it number of states, but number of states of uh, gravitational fluctuation, if you like, you can call no, it. No, no but it's not about it's not about fluctuation. Uh, it's what I'm trying to say. It's not fluctuation. Fluct uh, uh, propagating fluctuation. It's what what is graviton. But uh, something which propagates with the velocity of light and it has its own helicity and all this stuff. Uh, but uh, but but when you are describing interaction, uh, it is this kind of, uh, you know, and you call it sometimes of shell, whatever. So, so yeah. it's not to, ca to count it in, in terms of number of gra gra uh, gravitons exchanges, I, I do not think it's correct. Uh, uh, it okay. Okay, but uh, we do talk about off shell and on shell degrees of freedom. No, 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 off shell the degrees of freedom doesn't exist. There is no theoretical, theoretical point how to write, write career later of the field or whatever. But it's a okay. uh, degrees of freedom, it's, it's a real degrees of freedom. And you yeah, but once you have a current state, I can compute my correlation. There's nothing stops me from uh, writing a correlation. Here I've written it ng, but I could have done easily number uh, the correlation, two point correlation I could have built very easily no, with but, the operators. But, but, but I still. Can, uh, Call you not to call it num number of gravitons because I believe it is misleading. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't actually, know. Um, okay. that was one of the that... things I was confused about. Um, you know, why why were why were things quantum at all? <laughs> Sorry, what is quantum? Right, like what is quantum? Because you had like macroscopic masses, right? Yeah, you see the, the point which I mentioned to Arkady also, you don't have to go for gravity, you can do even in QED experiment. Yeah. So electron has a helicity state. So I was, what I'm interested in is to build a correlation, quantum correlation between the helicity states. And the way I build the helicity states in the gravity is by putting the spin in my diamond. So I have got spin up and spin down system. And now I can do an experiment where I can look into this, uh, uh, the, the correlation, spin correlation. No, Sorry, the spin helicity states of maybe <laughs> I'm just repeating our oh, but, question. Uh, what, but, what is it the helicity states of? Yeah, spin uh, correlation. Spin, uh, I, uh, spin correlation exists uh, as a classical level. Uh, okay, if no, uh, forgetting about. No, no, that's the difference. Uh, so, yes. so, so, so you, you you still have this correlation, right? But you do not. That's uh, true. It's not about exactly. quanti, 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 quantizing a graviton field. It, you, you, no, 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 there is a, yeah, there is a difference. There is a, uh, the classical level correlation and quantum correlation. There is a difference no, no, between uh, classical. Uh, I, I, am not sure about uh, that is the case because you have this uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, in gravity, for example, uh, both uh, charge, uh, analog of charge, mass, and spin interaction are fixed by equivalence principle. So, so in this way, yeah. the, uh, uh, it, it's already at the classical level. So interaction with yeah. spin is already classical. Yeah, but in the classical correlation, you will always get 50-50. And this you can do no, the calculation. No, you are talking about quantum nature of particles. It's not about quantum nature of graviton field. No, but what is important is that if the gravity is classical, the spin correlation will always be 50-50. Uh, no, okay, 
No, I, no, I disagree. I do not understand this. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so maybe we can, can do uh, it uh, just, just a calculation. A classical billiard will never entangle the two systems. This is the whole point. It's for, you, for this, okay. you need so, a So you are saying that to uh, adduction of potential between uh, in quantum mechanics, it's classical. I, I disagree. It's quantum. Okay. Okay, so let's um, let's move on to a more general discussion. Um, 